Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Aaron Levy, uh, and I'm a, a software engineer at CoreOS, as Josh said. I primarily work on Kubernetes-related things as they kind of relate to uh, kind of uh, cluster lifecycle, cluster deployment, that kind of thing. There's a, a bunch of new stuff in Kubernetes, and so it's a little bit difficult to you know, compartmentalize and say, well, these are the coolest new things in 1.4. The things for me might be different from you know, things that are really cool to you guys. This is actually, if you were to look at the Meetup page, this was the abstract of the talk that I was going to give. Um, you know, I'm going to go over some of the features that I'm most excited about in the 1.4 release uh, and discuss some of the improvements about cluster deployment, lifecycle management, because they make my life easier. What I actually did, what I actually submitted in terms of my abstract was this, because I'm a selfish individual and they make my life easier. So let's start over a little bit and I'll say, hi, my name's Aaron Levy and this is a completely biased overview of exciting new features in Kubernetes 1.4 as according to me and the things that I care about. So if we're gonna go over some of what are my favorite features in 1.4, one of them is this spreadsheet, Kubernetes Feature Tracking Board 1.4 release. One, it made this presentation really easy to, pre to prepare for. Going through it, it's the items that are new in 1.4, the stage that they're at, what SIG actually owns them, the links to their features, their documentation, that kind of thing. And you know, it might be a little bit weird that it's a, it's a spreadsheet is my favorite, but really this actually encompasses a lot of things, a lot of underlying work in 1.4 that I think was really important. Some of which was, um, oops. The feature tracking itself, if you guys aren't familiar with this, under the Kubernetes uh, organization, there's a repository called Features where it's actually now being really pragmatic about tracking the feature lifecycle from prior to there being an actual proposal for it, through the proposal, through code, through documentation, through its lifecycle of alpha, beta, and stable. Um, so I think that this is a really important thing and it's actually worked really well, I think, in the 1.4 release because now we can kind of surface all of these things in a really clean, simple way. Um, another one is, is documentation updates. We've had in prior releases, sometimes features go out and there isn't documentation with them until a couple like uh, patch releases past the actual release. I think there's done a really good job this time of every feature that went out, that every feature that was kind of publicized has documentation backing it and this is all kind of tracked, it was in that, that spreadsheet as well. And what this all kind of filtered back up to is if you actually look at the, the change log that went out with the 1.4 release, I've never actually been excited about a change log before, but this was actually really, really good. Like it describes every feature, a link to its documentation, a link to the feature repo, and then through every kind of section of like, what are the major themes of this release? Here's all the features for them. Here are the, the information you need about kind of uh, functionality changes. Here are um, you know, any kind of upgrade notes that you need. It's actually really, really helpful. So this, in my mind, is actually a really strong thing that went through the life cycle of 1.4 and something really important and actually does make my life easier. Once upon a time, a coworker asked me, how do you keep track of new features in Kubernetes? And this actually was, my response was, go through the proposals directory in the repository and then see anything that's changed recently. Then go through any open PRs that touch anything in the proposals directory and see if anything's in there. And then just kind of like scrape the types.go files for the API objects and then that's how you figure out what's going on in Kubernetes. So I think this is actually like really, really nice um, and something that in 1.4 has been pretty awesome. So one of my next favorite uh, features is deploying the pod network as an actual Kubernetes object. So what this is, is um, the pod network first is kind of Kubernetes model of how uh, networking works is that every pod gets assigned its own IP address and this simplifies a ton of things. You know, you can, a single pod can actually run a whole bunch of services have their own port. If you want them all listening on port 80, it's perfectly fine. It, it simplifies a lot. The problem is that in some um, environments, that's not super easy. Maybe you have one publicly routable IP, so you need something else, some other application that's there to kind of uh, you know, enable you to use this kind of uh, networking style. Um, but it's been difficult. It's like you need to, it's one more on host thing that you need to, to configure where you, know, you need to have your kubelet and you need to have your, your runtime and then you need to have some kind of uh, networking tool configured on the host that properly speaks to Docker that then you can launch your pods into. This is really cool in terms of now you can just say you know, kubectl create 
um, the pod network application, so this is things like Canal or Flannel or Weave, that application can be deployed just as a normal Kubernetes application. And what's actually happening underneath here is that the kubelet is just saying, well, the network plugin is just going to be CNI. And I'm just going to sit here, and I'm going to spin, and I'm not going to launch any pods until someone tells me how to actually configure the pod network. But this is pretty important because it just simplifies a, a whole lot of cluster deployment and, and management because now you're getting closer to the only thing that I need from a node to actually start it up is a kubelet and a container runtime. And then I can even deploy my, my networking layer on top of that as a Kubernetes application. And so this actually, um, Casey Davenport from Tigera is here tonight, and he's going to demo um, doing this. But this is something that I think is like really, really helpful just broadly for everyone, no matter how you do your networking. Um, I think it's going to be incredibly helpful. One of the other really cool um, 1.4 features is the Kubelet TLS Bootstrap. So what this is is that the Kubelet is now able to interact with a API um, endpoint that's been there since 1.3, but it's, it's a, a CSR endpoint, a certificate signing request endpoint. And so what you can do is your Kubelet can say, hey, I need a certificate to be a fully fledged client. So here's a CSR, and then the API server, the master, is going to say, well, I trust you or I don't for a number of different mechanics. It could be based on IP address, it could be you know, network trust, it could be other things. Um, and then it will sign a certificate, and then the Kubelet can get it, and now the Kubelet is a fully fledged member of your cluster. This is important because in a lot of ways prior to this, what uh, a lot of deployers were doing is that you just kind of spray out a whole bunch of certificates first, and then push those and their private key material out to all of your servers. And this isn't the right way of doing things. The private key material should never leave the actual host that it's on. And so in this way, what we can do is the Kubelet comes up, and then it, keeps, it generates private key material that never leaves the box. The CSR is public, and it puts it out to the API server. And the certificate it gets back is public. And so all of that is a much stronger security story. But it also simplifies the deployment of the clusters as well, because your node, potentially, doesn't even need to know, like it doesn't need these pre-generated assets pushed out to it. It can just actually create them and, and uh, on the fly as it joins the cluster. Um, and so what this, this actually looks like when you want to use it is that there's a flag on the kubelet called experimental bootstrap config. And that's essentially a kube config that tells uh, the, the kubelet how it can contact the API server. So you could give it like a, a token um, you could give it basic auth, you could give it any kind of auth method a kube config supports, but that token only would have access to a single endpoint, to the CSR endpoint, and nothing else. It's not a fully fledged client. Then using that, it, it actually gets its certificate back, joins the cluster, and it's a, it's a full client. So I think this also has been a problematic uh, piece of cluster deployment because it's difficult to describe to people, well, you need to have your kubelet have signed certificates in this way um, and use them in this way and rotate them in this way. And instead, we just have it automatically handle that for you. So kind of rolling these pieces up, some people did a ton of work um, on this tool called Kube Admin. And this is under feature issue 11, which is the title of which is like dramatically improve the, the ease of, of cluster deployment. And this is, it, the discussion ended up trying to, to work around towards what is the UX that we want out of cluster deployment, and then what do we need to do to get up to that point? And it kind of centralized around this right here, which is, well, the, the UX that we would like to have is an init step that initializes a master, and then a join step that you can run on nodes and just have them join, and that this should be essentially what an admin needs to do. Um, and so this is, this is actually part of 1.4. Um, and this really is the UX. So um, you know, there's, there's some, some other pieces of this, but essentially you can say kube admin init, and it'll initialize a master node, and then you can say kube admin join, and you give it a token that gets admitted by that first step, and then you tell it how to contact the master. But underneath that, what's actually going on is a couple of different things. So um, to kind of step back real quick on some of the stuff I talked about, the TLS bootstrap here in the self-hosted pod network so underneath, when it's joining that master, it's going through that CSR dance I just talked about. So you don't have to pre-distribute these certificates or this private key material. And then on top of that, once you have a running cluster, you can just deploy your self-hosted pod network um, onto that running cluster now. And you're not having to pre-configure Flannel or Weave or Canal or any of these other tools. You can just configure it as an actual object in the cluster itself. 
And then part of this as well, part of the, the work that's gone into this is packaging things up in RPMs and DEBs for, um, for OSs that, that support them uh, so that you can just install Kubelet or install these particular tools very easily. And then a discovery service, which is, has been part of this entire proposal where you know, it's, there's a couple steps here, one of which is where do I contact my master and how do I trust it? And this discovery service is a pretty interesting uh, kind of piece of this where the Kubelet can reach out to an arbitrary place. It could be a, a publicly accessible endpoint. It says, well, where's my API server and what's the, the root certificate that I should trust? OK, now I have that, but I want to become a member. So now I'm going to ask that, that, that location that I just got from the discovery service, here's my CSR, can I become a member? And it says yes. So the, the end point that we get to is just like such a, a simple bring up that you know, your, your Kubelet really on every host just becomes this is an endpoint you need to contact, and everything else just kind of falls into place from that. And I think that this is a big divergence from what we've kind of seen in cluster deployment so far, where there's a lot of steps to bring your host up to something that actually is functional in terms of a Kubernetes node, and then it can join the cluster. And so what we want to get to is that it joins the cluster and then becomes functional, and that's the only thing that you need to configure. Another one that I haven't even gotten to play with yet, but I really like, is pod affinity and pod anti-affinity. Um, the description from, the, from one of the, the documentation lines is this pod should or should not run um, on a node if it's already w running one or more pods that meet some label criteria. And I think that this is a really strong scheduling mechanic because you're going to be able to do things like uh, initially spread deploy uh, deployments of your applications across failure domains. So you could say, I only want you know, X number of pods to end up on the same location as as an existing pod of that same type. Um, you could do this in a hard way that do not schedule these pods um, in, on the same node. You could do it in a soft way where it's like try to spread these across you know, some kind of failure domain. And I think we can get some really cool um, kind of deployment mechanics out of this such that let's say I'm booting up a cluster and I want three copies of, of you know, kube DNS and I've only got one node. I say there's three copies. Three copies stand up on that first node and then they don't move. They never get rescheduled. They're just sitting there until they fail. And if the node does fail, they'll get rescheduled somewhere else. But with something like this, I could say, well, I only want one of those per node. There isn't really that much of a reason. It's not traffic-wise that I want multiple of these. It's failure domain. So actually try and spread them out across nodes. So I think this is actually really cool. Haven't gotten to play with it yet, but um, definitely want to make use of it. So these are the kind of things that I think, from, from my perspective, there's been some, some like really cool work going on. Um, I'm really, really happy about just kind of the, the feature tracking and surfacing of you know, the new things that are in each release. This used to be difficult to track. It used to be kind of a, a, an opaque um, look into like, well, what's actually there? How far along is it? Um, and then the self-hosted pod network, you'll see later tonight. I think that's really cool. The Kubelet TLS bootstrap, you probably won't like see or care about it very much, but from a security perspective, you want this kind of thing happening underneath. And then take a look at Kube Admin. Um, you know, it's it's a it's an alpha feature, but it's it's a from a, a, a UX perspective, just a really simple like two-step process to try and bring uh, bring nodes into a cluster. And then the pod anti affinity stuff. Um, so did I miss anything? Yeah, there's a ton in there. But take a look at the change log. People put a lot of time into this, particularly excited about it. Um, but the, every feature every, has you know, the documentation, the tracking, you know, how far along it is. Um, yeah, just a ton of information there. So thank you. Um, again, if this is interesting, we're always hiring CoreOS. It's a cool place. We get to work on fun stuff. Thank you guys so much.